نحمده ونصلي على رسوله الكريم أما بعد So inshallah today we will be starting Surah Al-Fatiha and before we start أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم we want to quickly go over uh, the isti'adah which is the seeking refuge with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before recitation of the Quran and this is necessary uh, because in Surah Al-Nahl Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says فَإِذَا قَرَأْتَ الْقُرْآنِ that whenever you recite the Quran فَاسْتَعِذْ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ then seek refuge with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from shaitan the rejected one now what does أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ mean it starts off with the first word is أَعُوذُ uh, which means to seek refuge that I seek refuge that I seek protection and this is necessary for a person when they are reciting the Quran because it could be so that the Quran instead of being used as a guidance the shaitan can actually deceive us and make us into thinking otherwise and misinterpret the Quran so it's necessary that whenever that we are trying to understand the Quran whenever that we are reciting the Quran then we must say a'udhu billahi minash shaitani rajim now a'udhu here we're seeking refuge or seeking protection with who? With Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah, the word Allah is the ismul azam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's the most unique name of Allah. And this is the name which comprises all the meaning which we find in the 99 names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mina shaitani rajim is from shaitan. Now shaitan is the name of Iblis. Um, it is the laqab of Iblis in the sense that Iblis has now become a shaitan due to him disobeying the orders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then challenging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he may um, misguide human beings. Ar-Rajim literally means the rejected one because we know that from the court of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, shaitan was rejected. Then we go into the surah in itself and this surah is called Surah Al-Fatiha and the name Surah Al-Fatiha comes from uh, one of various places, and but this is not the restricted or the only name of the Surah. Imam Qurtubi rahimahullah he brings actually twelve names for this Surah, and some of some of them are synonyms for others, um, but. The surahs, each name actually comes from different ahadith, different parts of the Quran, and comprised together, uh, these names can all refer back to Surah Al-Fatiha. However, when we look at this surah, the most mashhur name, the most famous name is actually Surah Al-Fatiha. And the Al-Fatiha literally means the opening one or the beginning, um, something. And that is because that whenever we start the Quran and the recitation of the Quran from this order, the order that Rasulullah set out, the order that Usman ta'ala anhu actually um, put together and he wrote down. And that one starts with Al-Fatiha, the opening. And because it starts with this surah, this is now named Al-Fatiha. However, there are three other famous names or two other famous names alongside with Al-Fatiha that are used um, by the Mufassirun and the scholars of the Quran. The other name is Ummul Kitab, which is the mother of the book, and it's referred to as Ummul Kitab, and mainly because the, you could say that the Surah Al Fatiha comprises of everything that the Quran has to offer all the guidance, all the um, usul, all the principles that the Quran has to offer is inside the Surah Al Fatiha. So, this is why some scholars have um, favored the name Ummul Kitab over others. Also, another name is As Sab'ul Mathani, the seven oft repeated. And we know this because there are seven ayats in the Quran, and we know that many, many times in a day, especially in the 17 raka'at of Fard Salah, one is required to read Surah Al Fatiha. And then in the Nawafils, in the Sunans, and um, for many other reasons, a person reads Surah Al Fatiha. And it's almost like an anthem. It's almost like a, um, such, such a repeated ayat that you can now call it the seven repeated ayats of the Qur'an and it's referred to, referred to like that um, in the Qur'an in itself. Now, we come to the surah and the surah is actually a Makki surah. Now, when we go into understanding the, uh, understanding the Qur'an, we want to, to, 
make one thing clear from the beginning, which is that some surahs are Makki and some surahs are Madani. The Makki surahs are the ones that have been revealed um, in Makkah al Mukarramah, while the Madani surahs are re were revealed in Medina. But when we say Makkah or Medina, we mean before Hijrah, some of these surahs were revealed, and those are known as the Makki surahs. And after Hijrah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, some of these surahs were revealed, and these are called Madani surah. Now, what's the key differences between the two? It's the topic of the surahs. The Makki surahs, we usually will talk, talk about Akida issues, about Akhirah, Jannah, Jahannam, about refuting shirk, um, historical issues about how other nations were. And however, the Mad Madani surah actually will talk about the ahkam, the rules and regulation Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put for the human beings or in specific for the Muslims. Now, this is the key difference between the surah and this is why whenever we see a pattern within these different surahs, we will see that um, some of these surahs focus only on the Akidah issues, only about refuting shirk. However, other surahs, they're always um, talking about the ahkam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, some orders that are specific for the Muslim and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is a very important aspect to understand the theme of the Quran and in specific the theme of the surah itself. Now, the surah starts off with Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. However, some scholars have said that Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim is not part of the surah. So, in general, when it comes to um, recitation of the Quran, we know that most, um, we know that mostly Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim is counted amongst many mushaf, many copies of the Quran as the first ayah. So, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim means in the name of Allah, the most merciful or the most beneficial, uh, the all merciful. Now, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, before we go there, we want to start off with Bismillah. Now, Bismillah means in the name of Allah, and this sentence is literally starting off with the action that the person is doing being hidden, which means that I begin in the name of Allah. It could be I am reciting in the name of Allah. And in other instances, when we use the word Bismillah, um, for whatever action that we're doing, it means that the the chosen fi'il or the hidden fi'il is actually the hidden verb uh, the hidden action is actually the action that we were we are doing so for example if a person wants to be eating and he says bismillah means akulu bismillah meaning i am eating in the name of allah now bismillah the word ism um, is the first word and the alif in the ism is actually dropped. And this was dropped originally in the first copy of the Quran that was written by Usman radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And this is why this tradition continues. Uh, otherwise, if you look at the, in, in general, the rules of khat, which is the rules of writing, you would normally add the alif before the sin. But however, this has been dropped. And traditionally, um, in the Arabic language, this continued to be dropped throughout the ages. So we have in the name, in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we, co we covered this name in, 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 the, in the previous sentence, which is A'udhu Billahi. And this is, again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's most glorif glorified name, most magnificent name. And the meaning of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is such that it comprises all the 99 names. Then we have Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Now, from face value, if you look at it just from a linguistic perspective, Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim are supposed to be two synonyms, two words that almost mean the same thing. However, the Mufassirun, they have uh, clarified or they have differentiated between the two, uh, between the two names. Ar-Rahman, they say that it means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being all kind or all beneficial. And that extends to every single person or every single being on the face of this earth. And regardless if this person obeys Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or not, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's Rahmaniyat or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's uh, uh, beneficial Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being beneficial or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being kind extends to all of those beings and this is why one of the reasons why we see those people who disbelieve in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala these people are still given the chance to breathe these people are still given the chance to live in this uh, dunya um, hatta until a set appointed time however the word ar-rahim is more specific and the ulama have said that ar-rahim is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy He's such a mercy that will extend on the day of judgment only towards the Muslims. And this Rahim, it's so powerful that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 
will use his Rahim Sifa, that attribute of his being Rahim, to enter the Mu'mins in Jannah, even though many people or most people do not deserve uh, or haven't acquired Jannah for themselves. Then we go to the core of the surah, and like we mentioned, many other names for the surah, sometimes we can call the surah itself Alhamdulillah as well, or Alhamdu. And the, the beginning of the surah starts off with Alhamdulillah, and here it means all praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, the meaning of the word praise, it's not thanks, um, because some people think that praising is to say thank you. And that's not the case because thanks requires a person to do something for us to uh, reply back. So if someone does something for you, then you would say thank you for that or you would thank the person. But in this case, when we say that praise belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, before any good has reached us, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is already due the praise. And this is why we see that alhamdulillah is one of the greatest form of zikr. And we know that it's one of the greatest form of zikr. So it starts off with Alhamdulillah, all praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rabbil Alameen, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being the Lord of the whole universe or the Lord of all the creation. Now the word Rabb comes from a person who owns something as well as a person who nurtures for something, looks after something. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is being reflected as the Rabb, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is being described as the Rabb, it means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not just own the whole of the creation, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also nurtures the whole of the creation. And this is a very important attribute of Allah, because for us to understand who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, it's necessary for us to understand his rub rububiyya, how much of a Rabb he is or how he is actually nurturing us, how he is sustaining us, how, is he, how he is making the whole dunya for us. Now, al-alameen, the word alameen comes from the word alam, and the word alam means the world. And alameen is the plural of the word world, so it's worlds. Now, in modern day, uh, we would call that universe. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the Rabb or the Lord of the whole universe. Then the next ayat goes into ar rahman ar rahim now we're repeating the same ayahs that we repeated, uh, the same bits or the same parts or the same names that we repeated in Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, and we will continue to um, translate this as normal, which is Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is all merciful. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is all beneficial. Now Maliki Yawmiddin, the word Malik, and some scholars, um, some scholars of the Quran, they read it as a Malik. Now. The word Malik and the word Malik, if you combine both meanings, it means um, a person who is in charge and a person who is in control as well as ownership. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is when we are referring the word Malik to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the word Malik to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the owner as well as the controller of the mudafile of the thing being possessed here. Now, why is being possessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is the yawm din Yawm is a day or is referred to a day. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best what's the description of this day, what is the um, sifats or the attributes of this day. And this day is known as yawm din Now, the word din comes from the word debt, which is dain. And dain means that when you have to pay someone back, this is called dain. So din is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on that day will make sure that everybody pays everybody back. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ta is the owner of such a day. And in modern day translation, we will say that Allah is the owner. He is the owner. He is the master of the day of judgment or the day of recompensation. And this extends and this meaning comes from the word deen, uh, which comes from the word day. Then we have a sudden shift in the surah, which is called iltifat in Arabic, which is that now that we were up to this point, if we look at from the beginning to uh, beginning, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Ar Rahman Ar Rahim, and Maliki Yawmiddin, up to this point, we were in the third person, meaning that in, we were speaking as if the, the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, uh, we weren't speaking directly to Allah, but rather as he is uh, uh, the third person. However, we go into this ayah and immediately it goes now that it goes to a mode which, which is the first person. 
or, or the second person, sorry. And what the second person means is now we are speaking directly to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we know so beginning straight after praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are now talking directly to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when we do, what's the first thing that we say? We say, Iyaka na'budu. That only you we worship. Now, this is a very interesting um, sentence structure. Now, in the Arabic language, you could have said, na'buduka, meaning that we worship you. But we don't want to say that because this does not refute shirk. This does not give the possibility that we do shirk. It could be that we worship you and other things. However, when we say, iyaka first, we are, try, we are stating or we are confirming that only you, O oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we worship. And the word na'budu comes from the word abdun. Now, abdun is a slave. Now, a slave is, a, is, is such that they listen and obey the commands of their master. And we know that when we say, oh Allah, we worship you, or we are your slaves, oh Allah, we obey, and co obey your command and we listen and we obey your command to the letter. And this is our statement of faith that we are making to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then we say, The sentence structure is the same again. Only you we seek help from. Now, Aun um, is such a help that when you know that somebody can help you, that's when you seek that kind of help. This is not the help of a general help, which is Nasarun. Now, this is Aunun, which is more intimate help. Help physically, help spiritually, help mentally, help financially. All of these help comprised together is called Isti'ana. A seeking that is called isti'ana. So we say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wa iyyaka nasta'in, meaning only you we, we seek help from. And we know that this means this is the essence of our worship. Our worship is to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and all the needs that we have, all the needs that we have, we present them only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is called isti'ana or wa iyyaka nasta'in. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes us through a journey within the surah, now into asking him. So first we acknowledge the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who's due, um, who's due praise. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the Lord of the universe. Then we acknowledge the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most merciful. Then we acknowledge the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the owner of such a day where we will be given our compensation or we, com or we will have to compensate others. Then we went into asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that only you we worship, only you we ask for help. So whatever that is that's coming before, whatever this day is that's coming before, um, uh, that, that's, that's been mentioned before, that we ask you to help us on this day. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers the help immediately. And he says, and we ask him, we say, that guide us. So we know that the answer to the help that we're seeking is that we get guided. And ihdina, what, are we, what, what, what do we want to be guided towards? We want to be guided towards a sirat al-mustaqim. Now sirat al-mustaqim is, sirat is literally a path. Now it's such a path where there are no diversions from the path. Now, if you have a road which has various roads that are off that road, this is not called a sirat. A sirat is such a road where you have no off roads, where you don't have any chances of diversion. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making us ask him, ask such a road where there are no diversions. Then we say al-mustaqim. Now, this road is upright, meaning it's very clear. It's like as if it's going up. Now, mustaqim comes from the word qama yaqumu or qaimun which means to stand up. So this is like an erected road, such a straight road, a path that leads us only to Jannah. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ihdina sirat al-mustaqim, that guide us to the straight path. Sirat al-ladina an'amta alayhim. Now we go, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is now explaining, is making us explain. When we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's reminding us, where are we going to find this path? Because as soon as we ask, this is the beauty of Surah Al-Fatiha, that as we ask, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala immediately gives us the answer. He says, Sirat al an'amta alayhim, that the path of those you have favored upon, or you have favored upon them. So it's such a path that you've given to people before, and you favored these people so that they can tread on this path. Meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that this path has already existed. And when you're asking for a path that's already gone, 
That means all you have to do is go and follow. And this is why we have the Quran al Karim. It talks about the path that different prophets took. It talks about the path that different um, awliya, the different salihun took. And also we have the examples of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where various paths, various ways where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam attained success in this dunya and how he guided the Sahaba to, um, to attain salvation in this dunya and in the Akhirah. So this is the path that we are after and this is the path that we want to approach. So Sirat al an'amta alayhim. Now, one of the best ways to understand anything in any language, and one of the rules, this is like a rule in Arabic language, is to understand something, you want to learn the opposite. So if you really want to know what hot is, you need to understand what cold is. So in this way, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is using that same manner, and he's teaching us that, wait, this path, if you want to identify this path, then there is two sifats or two properties it can't have. Number one is غَيْرِ maghdubi alayhim. It is not the path. So this is not the path of those people that have been angered upon. So we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَبَاءُوا بِغَضَبٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ That these people, they returned with the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is referring to the Jewish community and some of them, uh, the followers of Musa alayhi salam, these people, they challenged Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in various ways. So they returned with the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we seek refuge from that path and we want to identify uh, that path so that we don't tread it. Then the second property of this, of this path doesn't have is waladdalin, that it is not the one, the path of those people who are lost. Now the lost people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about various uh, groups of people in the Quran that are deemed lo losers or the deemed lost. Now we want to avoid that path and this is why we approach the Quran. And if you look at the whole Surah Al-Fatiha, it's almost prompting us to go and learn what does the rest of the Quran say? What is this path? What's the description of the path in the Quran? And also prompting us for, um, to remind us that we are continuously affirming or we're confirming that we are worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a very, very important Surah and this surah, obviously, in a few minutes, there's no, it's, it's not justified. However, for the sake of this course, where we're just translating and trying to understand the context of each ayah, we will, inshallah, pause here, and we will start Surah Al-Baqarah next. And we want to be able to continue to learn Surah Al-Fatiha. Whenever we get the chance to read the different tafasir and the different books of um, uh, commentary of the Qur'an, we want to focus on Surah Al-Fatiha because you have to understand for every single Muslim, it is actually the most, the most um, connected or the most beloved Surah, you could say almost, and the most known Surah, the mashhur Surah for a Muslim is Surah Al-Fatiha. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq to fully understand it, fully comprehend it, and act upon it. Wa da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.